Good morning. Today's scripture is coming from John 20, 11 through 18. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. Now Jesus stood outside the tomb crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white, seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and one at the other foot. They asked her, woman, why are you crying? They have taken my Lord away, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it you are looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said, do not hold on to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them what he had said these things to her. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. It gives us courage, connects the seen with the unseen, and empowers us to overcome obstacles. Faith turns storms into opportunities, and setbacks into comebacks. It refines us through trials, making us stronger and resilient. With faith, the impossible becomes possible. It fills our hearts with hope, minds with clarity, and spirits with strength. Trust in God. Embrace the journey, for it reveals miracles and realizes dreams. Hold fast to faith, because with faith, we are never alone. We are never alone with faith. In fact, that's probably why you're here this morning. You would not be here this morning had you not been faithful. In fact, a few weeks ago, we celebrated Easter. Were you here for Easter? I mean, this place was teeming. It was absolutely awesome. At 7.30 in the morning, or some crazy hour in the morning, we had a sunrise service. And then we covered the cross with flowers. We released live butterflies. Then we had a lot of coffee. And then we came in here, and the sanctuary was full to overflowing. We even had the balcony. It was full of people. And afterwards, we celebrated a brunch. Wow, Easter, Resurrection Sunday, the message of the resurrection. That's what it's all about. In fact, everything that we do, everything that you do as a Christian is contingent on that very moment, on the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Think about it. If the resurrection did not happen, this would be pointless. Preaching and teaching would be futile. Loving each other wouldn't make a lot of sense. If the resurrection didn't happen, we'd have, you ready for this? Half a Bible. Hmm. we would have not learned about the love of a personal God. That one-on-one -on -one relationship that you have with God. Higher expressions of, of music like Bach and Beethoven wouldn't have happened. Devout Christians. Universities like Yale and Harvard that were started with Christians full of compassion and wanting to seek answers to life's deepest, darkest questions, 
Well, those wouldn't exist either. Hospitals like St. Jude's Children Hospital, St. Francis, St. Joseph, started by people also full of compassion that wanted to help the ill get better. Those wouldn't exist either. You know, it would be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. You've probably heard this cl cliche, the one that finishes with the most toys wins. So maybe you'd lie, cheat, and steal if that's all there was to do to, to get to where you had to be so you had the most toys because if when you die, that's all there is, the lights go off. What would this world be if there were no resurrection of the dead? We would have no future, no hope. Oh, are you feeling a little depressed? Well, good news, that's not the case. He is risen. Jesus rose from the dead. So what's the very first thing that God decides to do when he raises from the dead? Now, he's going to raise from the dead. He's going to change all of humanity, all of mankind, the entire universe. He has announced the inbreaking of the kingdom of God. And the very first thing he does, that's why you know it's not made up, is he appears to the women. Ah, he did it right. He appears to the courageous, fearless women of the Bible. Now, they must have been shaken. So today I have a question for you. How are you called to have the courageous, fearless compassion and drive that the women of the Bible Let's pray on it. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this worship service. And Lord, we pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts is pleasing to you, O Father, our rock and our redeemer. We pray that all of your messages here, whether spoken or unspoken, are experienced by everyone. And now, Lord, I ask you to pull me out of this service. Lord, may your words be my words. We lift this up in the name of Jesus Christ and all of God's children say together, amen. Boy, I couldn't hear that up here very much. I'll give you a pass. Hey, growing up in church, uh, surprise, I kind of grew up in church. You know, my parents would take me. Anyone have that? Your parents are taking you and they send you to Sunday school. I'm six, seven years old. And they, and they say, hey, you've got to memorize scripture. <laughs> yeah, right you got to memorize scripture. And so they made us memorize things like the 23rd Psalm. I wanted to memorize 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14. Anyone? Look it up. I'll throw you a bone. The disciples had to do the same thing. In fact, if you were growing up in biblical times without TVs and Game Boys and the internet and all these other kind of things, guess what you did with your parents every morning? Yeah, you memorized the Torah. Now, I had a rough time doing that with the thee, thy, thou, all those kind of things because we were looking at the King James. But in biblical times, they're actually memorizing Old Testament scripture. And the whole premise of doing that so they would recognize the Messiah. And it still blows my mind that there are 453 prophecies that were met through the birth, the life, the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. <gasps> and the disciples still didn't get it when he ascends. I mean, do you think he was up there going, really, guys? 
I mean, people didn't realize it until he appears in his resurrected state and starts walking around. And there's 11 different places, at least 11 different places in the Bible where he appears to people. And the first thing God does to announce himself is he appears to the women. Now, guys, times were different. Right now, when my wife speaks, oh, I listen. Oh, yeah. Right? Not so much in biblical times. You know, women were truly second class citizens. There's many fascinating women in the Bible. There's at least 188 of them named. There's queens, there's prophets, prophetesses. I don't know how you say that. Is that a word? There's deacons of the church. There's several women with bad reputations. There's other women that life was filled with, with grace and peace and faith and their lives transformed their very world and that of the world of people around them. Oh, and our world too. I mean, here we are 2,000 years later talking about them. Do you have the courageous, fearless faith that the women of the Bible did? The backbone that the women of the Bible did. They could have been dragged out and killed. Women are not listed as disciples in the Bible. Wouldn't have been appropriate at that time. Maybe we need to reconsider that. Women were the last ones mentioned at the cross. Where were you guys? Huh, there was one of them there. The last ones to be mentioned at the cross and the very first ones that Jesus Christ arrives to, the risen Christ. Women were the first people the risen Christ spoke with. And now they have to go tell everyone. You wouldn't make that up. Hey, uh, And why would you be prioritizing something in front of God? Why are you listening, prioritizing circumstances, people over God? In Mark 16, 9, it tells us about Mary Magdalene before she believed in Jesus. It's an example of how God's power transforms a person into a new person. And I love it because it describes Mary Magdalene using the number seven, God's perfect number, the foundation of God's word. It means completeness. It means perfection. There's seven days in a week. We take a Sabbath on the seventh day. The first day of the week is right now. It's Sunday. There are 860 references to the number seven in the Bible. Please listen as we hear the word of God. Now when he rose early on the first day of the week. He appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, 
they would not believe it. She had seven demons. Now, rumor has it that one of those demons was, you know, the oldest profession. Mary Magdalene had a little bit of a reputation. And the Bible simply uses five words in John 20, 18. When Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. Jesus raises from the dead. He appears to Mary Magdalene. Do you want to know what he said? I can wait. Do you want to know what he said? Thank you. We're going to do a little bit of a word study here. Because it's important in English when we translate things, sometimes things lose their focus. Let's look at the original Greek. It'll be up on the screen. There we go. That's the original Greek word. That is the word that Jesus said to Mary Magdalene when he rose from the dead. It is pronounced let it go. It sounds like let it go. And it means the argument's over. It means we're laying aside the argument. It means we are putting the argument to rest. We are bringing the argument to a closure. We are moving to conclusion. To conclusion. It means it is finished. And do you know what that meant for Mary Magdalene? It meant that everything that Jesus had said and had promised and had talked about was done. It's closure in her mind. Jesus did it all. She has seen the risen Lord. And she carries this message to the disciples. Can you imagine what that walk back would have been for her? The Bible says, I have been to the grave of Jesus. I've seen the stone rolled away. The tomb is empty. I went to the garden to pray. There I met I met the risen Savior, Jesus. He called me by name. I believe everything. Do you believe everything in the Bible? He said, I have no doubts, no fears. She's saying, I believe in the risen Christ. She's saying, I believe in the Easter Jesus. And apparently many hundreds of people also do that filled this place on Easter. Hi online, where are ya? We're right here. <laughs> Come on. All of that meaning is rolled up in that one word that Jesus said to her. Let it go. It comes to conclusion. Now, there's several women at the, at the tomb that morning, right? There are myrrh bearers. Does anyone remember myrrh? Myrrh is put on the body in order to kind of embalm it. It's a kind of resin. It turns yellowish. It would have an aroma of, of flowers. Where did we hear about myrrh first? Oh, someone even answered right. Gold star in church, right? We three kings of Orient, uh, right? Bearing gold and sense and myrrh. They brought it to the baby. And Jesus was on the cross. Where do we hear about myrrh again? Remember, they dip a rag into vinegar and myrrh. Guess what? He didn't need it there either. And now it shows up at the tomb and what happens? He's not there. Doesn't need it there either. The stone has already been rolled away. And she says, standing there, trying to figure out what happened. She says, behold, two men suddenly in dazzling clothes stood near them. And as the women were terrified and these women were frightened, they bowed their heads and faced towards the ground. The men said to them, I love this one. Why do you seek the living 
one among the dead. He's not here. He is risen. Then they remembered Jesus' words and returned and went back to report all of the things to the 11 disciples and to the rest. So we've got two sets of women. And this creates separation. And separation, when they come back to report to the men, creates verification. Right? Mary Magdalene has seen them. These other women have seen them. These women went out here. Mary Magdalene went this way. They come back, and they don't just say, he's not there. They say they've had an encounter with the risen Christ. So we got Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, the other woman with them are, are telling the apostles all of these things. Now had the women said the body's gone, eh, it would have been discounted in those terms, in biblical terms. That's a woman's tale. Women don't ha ha have any clout. It would be written off. They would have ignored it. They would have called it idle gossip. Just idle women talking. You would not make up a story like this. The witness and the testimony of a woman those days didn't have the clout that a man did. There, there were, they didn't have the clout in personal matters. They didn't even have that clout in legal matters. But something else happened. They said, we've seen the risen Christ. He's alive. Call us on it. They experienced Jesus. They met Jesus. They saw the risen Lord. And now they're proclaiming the sacred and eternal salvation that we all do right here and right now. You are a beloved child of God. You're a Christian. He has risen. You have a personal relationship with, he, with him in your heart. And you should do the same as the courageous, fearless women of the Bible did. No pressure. Our church family is called to do this. It's called to proclaim the good news of the gospel. That's what we're here about. That's what Sunday morning is all about. It's about telling people about Jesus, about his blessings, about hope, about joy, about eternal life. It's powerful news. It is not political. It is not some fairy tale. This is the power of the resurrected Christ that lives in your heart. The Apostle Paul tells the church in Ephesus, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you. He's speaking to you. to the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people and his incomparably great power for us who believe. Yeah, we break the mold, we Christians. The power is the same as the mighty power and the strength that was exerted when God raised Christ from the dead. The same power that lives in you raised Christ from the dead.
If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will experience that change. You will experience that transformation. Sometimes we just got to be quiet and let it happen. It's tough. I tend to pray and I have a, just a list of stuff. Lord, I need this. <laughs> I need a long hair. Right? Something. But it's tough to just listen to God when you realize that same power is inside of you. And so I want to encourage you to let this transformation happen in you. I have to let you know that uh, part of my job as a disciple of Jesus Christ and as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted. If you're hurting, if you're having a hard time in life, whatever that is, I'm here to love on you, to pray with you, open the Bible, let's see what the Bible says. That's what churches do. We are a church family. We do that. But another job of mine is to afflict the comfortable. If you are comfortable in your walk with Jesus Christ, it doesn't stop there. You don't just say, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. I'm done. I can die. I'm called to afflict you, to call you to action. We've got to, as a church, win the lost for Christ. So my second purpose is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. All of us are on that same mission. You know, love thy neighbor more than yourself. Hey, how you doing on that one? Loving thy neighbor. Pretty good? Huh, think about that one. We're called to bring people to Christ. Kingdom growth. And let's not forget the second part of it, and that is church growth. I online. New people coming to this place. So we've got to learn to balance the two of that, to support each other and love on each other, right? And make disciples and then church growth. So I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to ask you to raise the standard in your life. Are you ready? Hold on to your seats. I don't know if there's seatbelts in there or not, but check it. Set your alarm clock five minutes early. Hold on. And before you put your feet on the ground, pray. You'll be all right. Five minutes. Volunteer more. We got the, the red bus out there. We have so many things in next gen. I mean, did Marie blow you away? It is so exciting to be part of that next-gen ministry. Push harder for the kingdom. Pray more. Pray longer. Hold somebody's hand at lunch or dinner tonight and pray. And it doesn't have to be a giant prayer. You can just say, Lord, we're praying. Your servant's listening. And you don't have to say anything. Just listen. Do it for 30 seconds. It will change your world. Pray more often. Pray longer. Pray for this church. Love louder. Love stronger. Be courageous. Be fearless. Risk it all. Just like the women of God. That transform this world. Mary Magdalene's experience was transformational for her. And we have that same experience. Her experience is our experience. We have sighted, we interact with the Holy Spirit that lives inside of us, that raised Jesus from the dead, lives inside of you. 
And so will you do the same as those courageous, fearless women of the Bible only could? Deliver that message. And here it is. I have seen. I have sighted. The risen Christ. In the name of the Father, and in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this worship service and the excitement and the love that I am experiencing this morning with my church family. Lord, I ask that my life point to your love and to the kingdom of God. I ask that you grace me with the ability to spend more time with you, to pray more often, to love louder, to love stronger, to grow this church. Lord, I know that one Christian is no Christian and that you created us to be in relationship with others. And I ask that you grant me the ability to help grow my home and help grow my church. All for your glory do we pray in the powerful and mighty name of the living Jesus Christ. And all of God's children say, Amen. Will you join me now in a word of prayer? Oh God, thank you for always being with us. Because you never leave us, we can be strong, courageous, and fearless. Thank you for sending your Holy Spirit to come alongside of us to be our companion and helper. Dear Lord, like your servants named Mary and others mentioned in the Bible, Give us similar courage to follow you even when it's hard and when we walk through dark valleys. 
Lord, we know so many are struggling and losing loved ones during this time of war and conflict in Israel and neighboring countries. Help those affected to be strong and steadfast in their faith. Heavenly Father, we pray for our pastors and leaders in our church. Give them the necessary strength to stand tall when challenged and braveness to make tough decisions. Help us to do what must be done, not just what is easy or comfortable or for our own benefit. When you call us to take a step of faith, give us the boldness to take that first step, which is often the most difficult. Oh God, we certainly know how much we humbly need your Holy Spirit so we may be empowered to live the life that brings honor and glory to your name. Give us the courage to share your love and grace with those around us and be a shining light that points toward you and makes disciples for Christ. These things we ask in your name and with the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We're going to do it in Spanish. Padre nuestro que estás en los cielos, santificado sea tu nombre. Venga a nosotros tu reino. Hágase su voluntad en la tierra como en los cielos y danos hoy nuestro pan de cada día. Perdona nuestras ofensas como también nosotros perdonamos a los que nos ofenden. No nos dejes caer en tentación y líbranos del mal. Amén. And let's stand for our closing hymn. Courageous, fearless faith. No pressure, anybody. No pressure. God has called you and he has put you in the centerpiece of your world. In a framework where only you can live. And he's done it for a purpose. You've got to work that out with God. But whatever it is, he calls you to serve him, to glorify him, and to evangelize his word. When we gather here on Sundays, 
we don't just gather and scatter. We gather and we are sent. You are sent as children of the risen God. And now may the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. <laughs> and may he give you his peace and his love and his grace. In your going out and in your coming in, in your lying down and in your rising up, in your labor and in your leisure, in your laughter and in your tears, until that day in which you come to stand before Jesus, in which there is no sunset and no dawning. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.